In this episode, we'll be talking about three things. Designing for different service rhythms, how social relationships influence the design of services, and finally, the balance between security, trust, and convenience. And here is today's guest. This is Marcus Louis. Welcome to the Service Design Show. Hi guys, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome to a new episode of the Service Design Show. The show where you get to learn what some of the world's best service designers are currently thinking about. So you can use that knowledge to transform services and businesses all around the world to become more human-centered and eventually more successful. We bring you a new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So be sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss anything. My guest in this episode is Marcus Louis. Marcus is currently the group design director at Fjord in Hong Kong. And he told me that he uses the experience he gained through his passion for traveling in his day-to-day -day work. In the next 30 minutes, we'll be talking about designing for different service rhythms, how social relationships influence the design of services, and finally, the balance between security, trust, and convenience. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description, or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. For now, let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Marcus. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's, it's your, you must have one of the most amazing backdrops I've seen on the show. It's like a thunderstorm in Hong Kong, right? Indeed it is, a thunderstorm brewing on a Friday afternoon. Oh man, it's, it's like lightning and thunder, uh, mm. wow, um, cool. I, I have uh, the background of uh, the scenic Utrecht uh, here on the show. So that matches. Marcus, awesome to have you. And like I always ask the guests, the very first question is, when did you meet with service design? What was your first encounter with service design? Hmm. Okay. That's quite an interesting because it, it, there isn't a very formal point. I think I went into service design quite organically. Um, started off as an industrial designer and um, I've also worked in the brand world. And gradually, I think um, a lot of the, my, my work ended up being called brand experiences, which to me is almost like a bit of a precursor mm, to mm. service design, mm. uh, simply because I worked on a lot of work in retail, a lot of work that started going beyond retail and therefore got, got called, well, multidisciplinary design. Mm. I think when the first time I came across the notion of service design was when I was working as a consultant um, in Shanghai. And um, first we did a lot of product uh, development around 2009, 2010. And then a couple, couple of years after that, it, we reach a very immediate and very recognizable inflection point. Mm -hmm. Clients are coming to us asking for us to design services mm -hmm. for them. And therefore, as a different point of difference from product design, it became service design. Right, right. And, and uh, yeah. how long was that ago? How... That was around about, uh, well, 2011, hmm. I would say, mm -hmm. formally. Right, but the right. work that I've done that reflected service design is like 2006. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the story, I guess, of all yeah. the guests on the show so far. Like people have been doing service design before it had a name, you know, that's, uh, that's the interesting mm -hmm. part. Hmm. Marcus, uh, you've sent me three very interesting topic that I think none of them has been on the show yet. So I'm really curious to you, mm. hear your story about them. Um, I've sent you a few question starters and we'll co-create the questions as we go along, right? Good. I'll, yeah. um, I'll pick the first topic. And it's up to you to pick a question starter that goes along with this one. And this first topic is called urban density and perception of time. Is there a question starter that goes along with this one? Okay, I would pick why for this. Why does that have to do, why does urban density and perception of time have to do with service design? Please enlighten us. Well, 
I chose this backdrop partly to illustrate I work out of certainly and most definitively the most highly dense, you know, high density city in the world and a very vertical one. And um, with that in context, also, I've worked on certain projects that go across different cities in Asia. As an example, between Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Taipei. I often say Beijing, if you look at it as a gesture, as a city, is this. Mm. Shanghai is somewhere like that. Hong Kong (laughs) is this. It's a very, very vertical city. And uh, why I say it has a lot to do with um, service design, and I'll talk a little bit about time also, is each of these cities have a different density. Each of these cities have a different perception of time. With Hong Kong being definitely, it's one of the few cities that made New York look slow, okay, <laughs> in the world. And um, so it has absolutely everything to do with service design, simply because it affects the frequency at which people engage with media or, for example, shopping or food doesn't need to be seeked out. It comes to you because right, right, there's right. a drugstore in every block. Yeah, yeah. There's food that comes to you 24-7. Mm. <laughs> so that to me, it has everything to do with urban density because things are just so easy in a place in Hong Kong and so yeah. easily accessible physically. Yeah, yeah. So that's so really interesting. About so about designing a surface. Yeah, so, so designing, while designing a surface, um, mm. Time is a crucial aspect, of course it is, but uh, it, it really impacts how you design the same service across cities that have a different density. Is that what you're saying? Uh, certainly different densities, as well as a different rhythm. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to give you an example, in Hong Kong, I could be crossing the harbor three times a day in, in the subway without even thinking about it, mm. because all these things work like clockwork. Mm. The place mm. is, in a way, I started driving a couple of months ago, and I realized how short the distances are compared to Sydney or LA, you know, different cities I've lived in. Therefore, the expectation of things just being yeah. delivered to you or things being accessible to you, or how long it takes, how much downtime you have in between destinations is completely different. I, I, I really so like when the you're term designing service, a service, service rhythm. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's a great term. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very, very core um, of how you design a service simply because it changes the fundamental expectations yeah. of uh, customers. Mm-hmm. And um, anything else you... Yeah, and how does that influence your own work? So how do you incorporate this in your daily work? Well, when it comes to service design, then it has to do with how you manage customers' expectations. There are certain things that systems, you know, back-end systems create limitations of how soon things could be done. And if you look at that also as against the, I guess, the expectations on, from the customer side, how instant something needs to be, then you find that delta in between on how you need to manage it. Hmm. On the other side, you also have to figure out whether that service is being helpful or being too intrusive Hmm. Hmm. in managing people's expectations. So that's something that we could talk about in a bit. But I think the the expectation of the rhythm and the time, um, how instantaneous something is and how, I guess, uh, ubiquitous something is. Hmm. Um, Just to give you an example, um, the octopus cart, in Hong Kong is to me one of the really interesting innovations for this city. I use this it's for a public transport pretty much cart, I guess, right? Uh, well, it, it's more, much more than the Oyster in London, for example. Mm. Uh, the Oyster in London is a public transportation cart. This cart allows me to open the, the door at my apartment complex. It allows me to open the door at my office. Mm. It gets me through public car parks. I pay with it. And yet my data is hardly, it's not a credit card, it's a cash card, it's an RFID technology card. So all of these things have become so ubiquitous that one card actually gets you through everything. And that's also made possible through the urban density and the footfall, you know, for the infrastructure to 
to support that many people using it at the same time. So I think this is one of those things that is very interesting that you could push it to that level of extreme in Hong Kong. And one final question around this topic is, uh, I'm curious, how do, uh, how do these rhythms, the, the slow and the very fast paced rhythms influence each other or are they really separate? I would say, well, in Hong Kong in particular, it's one of those, you know, the, the cliche of being a city that never sleep, you know, is so appropriate in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where we understand the needs of the customers. Um, but at the same time, we also need to look on the other side is when is it appropriate to leave them alone mm. to actually take away the stimuli. Mm. So I think this is where both sides need to be considered and therefore fast time and slow time. I mean, a really good example when you consider service design is is fast food really fast food in a city like Hong Kong? Yes, it's fast to obtain. It needs to be fast for transaction, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to eat it fast. Exactly. It's yeah. the same customer journey, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Um, super interesting, but we have to move on to uh, the second topic, and I guess uh, it will probably relate somehow. And the second topic is social relationships mm -hmm. and service. Service. Is there a question starter that you have that fits with this one? I guess, how much? How much do we have to consider social relationships and service design? Hmm. Please so, yeah. okay, Eva, yep. Okay, so. I would say, okay, service design is a really core, I think the whole notion of service in Asia obviously is so fundamental to the culture. Way before the whole notion of service design came about in Asia, service is a very inherent part of the culture about delivering something to help people along something. Mm -hmm. That's not a new notion. I think putting the word design against it is one of those things that was a re recently, you know, relatively recent phenomenon. And I think one piece that has been a real burning question for me in every service design project is what do people actually expect as a relationship to the service itself? What I mean by that is, and I think a lot of guests you have interviewed talk about hierarchy and social relationship in a lot of, especially East, East Asian cultures. So I would say greater China, Japan, Korea, all of which have a confusion base in the culture yeah. that also starts to um, put services and people or people and people or brands and people, organizations and people into immediately, they need to sort out or the culture tends to put things at a hierarchy. Mm. So that also has to do with like what type of relationship you built through this service. And, and can, if you yeah, talk you about service design, ultimately, I think, can you give an example of this hierarchy in relationship to services? Okay, so if you look at, say, a relatively transactional service like food delivery, mm -hmm. as against, for example, and I'm sure this has to do, this is applicable across a lot of different cultures and markets, but especially important, important to consider. You know, for example, food delivery against personal. Um, banking, for example, one it need, by very nature needs to be very high touch because the service provider is being cast in a role as literally someone who serves this client. In the other piece, even though it's service again, but it's reduced to a much more transactional sort of dynamic because you might only see this guy once and yeah. you see him for 30 seconds. Yeah. So I think this is where it really, it, when we're designing service, it needs to be considering how you pitch and how you position this service against its audience mm. or against different tiers of its audience. And then mm. if that is actually well defined, then everything else gets much clearer when you start designing your service. So have you seen examples where this relationship, were, there was a mismatch in this relationship by design or by accident? 
Yeah, well, I think this is one of those cases where global brands trying to localize or adapt themselves in different Asian markets. And I've worked years ago on an optical retail project. Uh, that was before a lot of digital tools were available, but beginning to happen. And back in the Australian context, basically the optician and the customer sit side by side and they talk across the mirror. And I had an instinct that felt like that doesn't work in Hong Kong and in many parts of Asia, simply because you are casting your service consultant as an equal. Mm. So, you know, and you're, they're talking through the mirror, so they're not actually having direct eye contact. So that is one of those pieces where we ended up needing to reconfigure that face-to-face relationships that still allows the functional part of this optician, you know, helping the customer put on their glasses, but we actually have to create a little bit of a physical barrier mm. to actually make sure this personal space, you know, back to the whole point of urban density, this personal space is not being intruded, yeah. and in a way the server versus customer relationship is well defined. Mm-hmm. Super interesting, and I can I yeah. can see that people who who don't have a uh, who don't have the context of Asia, for instance, and only use the Western mindset to design service, will have a very hard time adopting to, for instance, creating or designing services in China. Uh, I would say yes. A lot of these are very very subtle nuances. Um, you know, one really great quote from one of the research respondents on this particular project was. So I cannot allow any chance of my niece touching another man other than Mm. my husband. (laughs) You know, that is such a cultural insight to me. And then likewise, when you have, when you have very high, you know, inherently digital services, how do you then on the other extreme is reestablish the personality of Mm. the service, how the human element of Mm. the service. Mm. Um, Super interesting stuff. And do you, I, I don't see yep. that many designers talking and thinking about social relationships in services that explicitly. Mm. Um, wh- what is your view on that? Should we do that more? Well, I think to me, it's almost something that's inherent in your own culture, Uh, you know, regardless of what type of service you're providing, whether it's digital or or physical or a combination of both, to me, that is almost something that is, it it, it runs parallel. That is one of those things I constantly challenge my teams, Um, especially within Asia. I think this is where that area about personal relationships often come to the fore in adapting establish service platforms to this market or so, in, you know, even if you're actually starting from zero and I, and I guess the thing and the trick here is um, your own culture is so much baked in into your personality that when you're designing a service for your own culture you don't even mm-hmm. notice the social relationships right but once you start to go abroad and notice how that social relationship differs in other contexts then you sort of start to become aware how it is in your own culture, I guess, right? Absolutely. And I also want to make, you know, just, I guess, make the point that we oftentimes talk about Asia as one homogenous culture, Mm -hmm. but it's not. So, you know, you've got the difference between even, for example, Japan is one society where service is casted in with very specific expectations. And then you've got mainland China and different parts of mainland China versus Hong Kong, where speed is such a you know important topic. Yeah. So all of this, I'm trying to also sort of cast the fact that Asia is a whole spectrum also in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Marcus, super interesting again. Um, yeah. But let's move on to the third topic. Uh, and I, I guess <clears throat> this mm-hmm. is something that it hasn't been on the show yet. And the third topic is called security, trust mm-hmm. and convenience, which mm-hmm. question starter goes along with this one. Yep. I would say how far? 
So how far can we go in keeping our customers safe and secure without compromising too much of their convenience? How do you tread this balance? Mm. And I think this is something that comes across all the time. And, and how far, uh, how, how far uh, is too far in your perception? Well, I think if it's something that has to do with keeping a customer secure actually prevents them to, from engaging that service or actually reduces their desire or their motivation to work with that service, that's too far because you are effectively shooting yourself in the foot as a yeah. business, right? Yeah. So I think there is oftentimes that, again, that, that delta between the, the interests of the service pro the interest of the customer in how do you make that compromise and, and I think it has a lot to do also and within the Asian context quite important is a lot of the trust actually happens and builds when you are actually serving that customer through your service design service design is not only about enabling a transaction or enabling someone to functionally do something it's if every bit of service transaction or service design is building a little bit more towards the trust of the mm. customer with mm. that brand. Mm. But then the one moment you either breach the trust or through your security, you severely inconvenience the customer, it's all gone. <laughs> so I think this is where that tension lies is how do we actually keep that balance? And I think a lot of the Mitigation work needs to happen in how you how you set up the expectations to begin with. And and um, again, can you give an example of is is there yeah. what is a good example of setting good expectations for this? Okay, as an example is say if you are a digital business and for some reason you've seen abnormal activities with this account and the company decides to shut them, you know, temporarily shut this member down. How do you communicate to this member? This member may be, or this customer may be an actual fraud, or they be, may be completely innocent. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that email or whatever that communication needs to be, needs to actually, and this is a real life example, is it needs to explain that whether you're innocent or you're fraudulent, this is actually, if you're an innocent customer, this is for your own interest. This is for your own safety and what needs to be done. And we apologize for the inconvenience. Please do X, Y, and Z right. to unlock your account. Mm -hmm. So I think being proactive is important. I think just being sort of when something happens, it's already, sometimes it's already too late. So you need to actually be proactive. And you need to somewhat educate Customers like yeah, maybe maybe educating why you're doing stuff before it actually happens. Is it exactly exactly? So it's it's very much about being preemptive, yeah, as well as being consistent in what you might do offline versus what you as a brand do online. A lot of times, different touch points for brands actually create contradictions between themselves. Like. Well, say if you are, say, saying something on a website, promising that it's really easy, and yet when the real experience is not exactly easy, is it worse that you said it, it's easy to begin with? Mm -hmm. I think that's where you actually need to temper that expectation and do not overpromise because when you can't deliver, it's worse than not saying it at all. Yeah. And how, how does... Um how does this impact, because I, I, I can really easily relate to this with digital services, online services, but how does this relate, for instance, mm -hmm. to physical, the more traditional physical services? Okay, um, as an example, again, in a lot of retail environments, and I think this is somewhere where the EQ of the, the actual service staff actually come in really important. But say if you have to physically design a store, um, the traditional mode for some stores, say, example, enable or they encourage the staff to circulate, you know, conventional wisdom for the staff to circulate and engage with the customer within that first three 
three meters when they walk in. But with, for example, a market like Hong Kong, you actually, in some cases, want to put the staff at the back third of the whole store so that they allow the customers to browse because Hong Kong customers are mature. They're very yeah. confident. Yeah. You leave them alone. And at, but at the same time, the moment they need help, you have to have that line of sight really quickly and enable your staff to actually get to them within a half a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it, what is your biggest um, question around this topic? You know, you said, how do we keep the balance? Is that the question that, 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 that keeps you awake around this topic? I think a lot of these things definitely have a lot of tension. They sound so contradictory. You know, you want to keep your customers secure and safe, but you want to give them, they need convenience. I mean, all of us have fallen victim of forgetting a password or having too many passwords, right, at the same time. Um, it's also about being efficient with a transaction or with an experience, but at the same time really managing their expectations along the way and making sure that it's more than a transaction. You at least give them a smile so that they would come back again. Mm. All of that is about building a little bit stronger relationship, building that trust with the customer. Mm. So how much is too much sometimes? And there, that's, therein lies the difference in markets. In some markets, in, even in Asia, you could talk more. In some other markets, you want to be much more cut and dry. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is typically a topic that designers will excel at. And I think this is typically a topic that requires some prototyping, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> So we're heading towards the end of the, uh, the show already. And I always have two questions. And the, the first question is for you. This is your opportunity to ask the people who are viewing or listening to this episode a question. What, what, mm -hmm. what would you like to ask the audience? OK, um, my question would be probably about design thinking. And this is something that it's an interesting topic having the word design thinking being used in Asia. Uh, you know, it, it's beginning to take root. Um, but how much design thinking? How much do we want to actually belabor this term? On the one side, we want to promote it because it is about keeping the interest of the user in the center. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it could also end up with some kind of orthodoxy that people just overuse it or misuse it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, 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 and I think it's yeah. already happening, you know. The, the moment it mm -hmm. landed on the front page of the Harvard Business Review, then that was the moment things changed. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think within the Asian context, I think where the risk is, is it becomes an orthodoxy or it becomes a recipe book yeah. that people just see that as a magic recipe to solve all problems. So, so and, if you would summarize, you know, I, what would yeah. the question be for the viewers? Okay. So how much are we going to actually banter with the word design thinking? What is the limit? Hmm. Um, how far would we go in using that word or should we move on? You know, are we become too enamored with that word as practitioners? That's, that's, a, or that's, a, are we actually, yeah, that's an awesome question. Are we being, are we lazy in using that as a shortcut yeah. also? Yeah. You know, are we getting too dependent on that word? And I, I think it's, uh, well, so no, that would let, let's question. leave it up to the viewers and listeners to comment on that. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, great question. So, Marcus, th this was it yep. for this episode, and uh, the thunderstorm seems to have passed in, uh, in the last uh, 30 Indeed. minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, thanks for Clearing your time. <laughs> thanks for sharing your ideas. You're very welcome. Very welcome. Thank you for having me. So, what are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Marcus? Let us know down below in the comments. This show is all about helping you to become a better service designer so you can make a bigger impact on the world around us. If this is your first time here and you'd like to see more interviews with service design pioneers, be sure to check out some of the best episodes and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. 
I'll see you in two weeks time for a new episode. And for now, thanks for watching.